A few years back, there was a special that ran on BBC called The Experiments with Darren Brown. On one particular episode, Darren held a game show called Remote Control, where the audience, all wearing masks to conceal their identity, were given complete control of a random gentleman's evening via hidden cameras and planted actors around him, all hired by the show. The man's name was Chris, and as the evening progressed, the audience was given choices by majority vote of causing either a good thing to happen to him, like winning a new TV, or a bad thing, like getting falsely accused of groping a woman. Excuse me. Yeah? Sorry, you just, you just touched me up. And without fail, the audience would continually make Chris's evening a living nightmare by picking the unfavorable circumstance every single time. He was overcharged by the bartender, had a drink spilled on him, got accused of shoplifting, and was quite literally arrested. The longer you watch, the more uncomfortable you feel as the curtain of comedy is slowly pulled back and it becomes hard to ignore just how sinister the audience's decisions truly are. All seemingly because they are able to hide behind a mask and blend into the crowd. So tonight's experiment is about the mob mentality that emerges when we can act anonymously and as part of a crowd. It's experiment, 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 experiment. So tonight's experiment is about the mob mentality that emerges when we can act anonymously and as Are you sure about that? Granted, despite the name of this show, this was not an experiment. There was no control group, and by making light of Chris's evening, framing the whole thing as a game show, and subtly egging them on, Darren Brown is almost certainly influencing the audience's decision to keep on heckling poor Chris. Now, don't get me wrong, when folks feel like they are anonymous, we do typically feel less responsibility for our actions and may even be more willing to follow questionable instructions. Like, there was a study done back in 69 by Philip Zimbardo where college students would be more willing to follow instructions to administer bolts of electricity to someone in another room if they were hooded than if they had to perform the shocking with no hood and a name tag on their shirt. Don't worry, no one was really being shocked, but the subjects didn't know that, and yet anonymity seemingly made them more cruel and obedient. So our friend Darren is tapping into something real with this show, and we're definitely going to be talking about that a bit today, but what I'm ultimately here to discuss is this moment right here, on the last segment of the show, when the audience decides that they want Chris to get kidnapped. <laughs> Hang on a second. Hang on, can we hold it? Can we lose? Oh, I can't hear. I can't hear this stupid. If you're talking. Okay, full disclosure, Chris is totally fine, and although the audience had truly been a real 2020 to him all evening, that last outcome was pre-shot and done with a stuntman dressed just like him. Chris was delivered safely to his home and given a letter explaining what's been happening to him and that new TV the crowd didn't pick. Darren tells this to the audience and goes on to explain that their decision making was so sinister because of something called de-individualization. By being thrown into a crowd and slapping on some creepy masks, the audience members have stopped behaving in a way that is socially acceptable and instead just act totally selfishly, or simply go with the flow of the crowd and atmosphere, despite how barbaric that may be. And again, there is truth to this like I mentioned with the hooded study and even with something called the online disinhibition effect, which basically states that when online, people tend to act out more frequently or extremely than they would in person because they feel less governed by social niceties or the need to maintain appearances. It's one of the things that makes cyberbullying such a real problem. Anonymity creates a comfort zone, a bubble of safety, a hamster ball of immunity where we suddenly feel comfortable making decisions we might not make if someone were monitoring us. And it's that comfort zone that the magical fourth wall preserves when we experience a story, be it in a game, a movie, a performance, or even a book. 
For those that don't know or haven't watched a video on the fourth wall before, which is understandable, they're really hard to find, the fourth wall is an imaginary wall separating the story from the audience. In a traditional story, the characters are interacting independent of anyone watching them and have no idea they're in a fictional world being observed by millions of adoring yet highly opinionated viewers. Much like Chris doesn't know he's on a game show, Harry Potter doesn't know he's part of a multi-million dollar franchise. And because of this, we the viewers slash players are free to enjoy, detest, manipulate, or make fun of characters and events in the show all we like. A luxury you don't exactly have with your family because they have feelings and notice when you're rude or don't laugh at their jokes. But when someone is behind a screen or on pages, you're free to interact with them however you like because you aren't really interacting with anyone. It's just pixels or ink, which is what makes breaking the fourth wall and breaking that anonymity such a bizarre sensation. So there's this scene in The Road to Morocco when Bob Hope and Bing Crosby are singing about well, the road to Morocco, and then make what I believe is the first reference to plot armor in history. For any villains we may meet, we haven't any fear. Paramount will protect us cause we're signed for five more years. And this is the most common form of fourth wall breaking. The meta reference, the inside joke, the wink wink, we know we're in a movie. Wait a minute, I'm not supposed to lose. Let me see the script. You see it at the end of Kiss Kiss Bang Bang when RDJ thanks you for watching, in Spaceballs when they literally watch their own movie to decide what to do next, in Wrestling when John Cena jokes about making a heel turn, in Kid Icarus Uprising when Pitt makes reference to game design, and all over the place in Deadpool. Her. Fourth wall break inside a fourth wall break. That's like 16 walls. Comedy is sort of the first level of fourth wall breaking. It doesn't exactly snap the anonymity of the viewer, but it does make you feel included because the characters are making reference to something that only the audience should know about. The fourth wall is broken, but you're still at a safe distance, and your hamster ball is unscathed. But what if you're minding your own business playing a game, and then this happens? This is a part out of Batman Arkham Asylum where the game crashes, restarts, and has you play as Joker in this surreal fever dream sequence. It was Rocksteady's way of making the player feel like they were losing it from Scarecrow's gas just like Batman was, and if you restarted your console or re-downloaded the game thinking there was a serious problem, you weren't the only one. This is a great example of what is sort of the second level of fourth wall breaking. The spooky coincidence, the double take goosebumps, the for that reason, I'm out. These breaks are almost totally exclusive to games because of their inherent interactivity with the player. Some good examples are how Bravely Second and Eternal Darkness appear to erase your save data or how the latter will turn your volume down even though your dog definitely isn't laying on the remote. How you have to plug your controller into the Player 2 port to beat Psycho Mantis. How X-Men makes you reset your Genesis to reset the in-game computer. How Flowey notices that you restarted before your last save to keep from killing Toriel. Things like this really start to encroach on your level of separation from the in-game world and are so perturbing because of our very human social wiring. Have you ever been doing something really embarrassing, like unironically flossing in the kitchen while you wait on your hot pocket to finish cooking, well beyond the point of it being okay to unironically floss, only then to notice someone is watching you ruin your whole career? Or have you ever been complaining about a coworker only for that coworker to come cartwheeling around the corner and ask what you were talking about? And with all the finesse of a Walmart bag holding one too many cans of leaking cat food said, Oh nothing. If so, you have felt the sensation of quickly shifting from a state of being inconspicuous and nameless to very much conspicuous and very much named, which totally shifts our psyche all at once, creating that chills down your spine moment. It's not just sudden fear that spooky fourth wall breaks create, it's sudden vulnerability. We touched on this in an older video, but people behave very differently when they feel like they're being watched versus when they're alone. This is sometimes called the audience effect and has been seen again and again in psych research from people being more willing to donate to charity, choosing not to litter, or choosing to follow social norms when in the presence of others. This seems to ring true even when people simply feel like they're being watched, even if they really aren't. 
One study found that bike theft drops massively in areas with signs that simply warn that people may be watching. Great fourth wall breaks capitalize on this by first allowing you to feel inconspicuous and comfortable and then make you feel like you're being watched when your guard is down. Have you ever been playing a game and felt a little awkward or uneasy when a character, without warning, stares directly into the camera? This feeling is due to something called the dual function of gaze. Where you look has a dual purpose. One of course is to select what you see, but the other is a form of communication. And when there is someone around, you're accountable for where you're looking. Don't you think you've seen enough? Which is why you'll rarely feel uncomfortable scrolling through someone's Facebook photos, but may want to avoid too much eye contact when around them. Now, when you watch a movie or play a game, assuming you're alone, which you should be right now, you're free to look wherever on the screen you like without judgment. You won't make Peter Kavinsky uncomfortable if you get lost in his eyes, as we all have. However, when the fourth wall begins to crumble or one of the characters looks directly at the camera like at the end of the movie Psycho or in the middle of the visual novel Psycho, you may suddenly feel like you should avoid eye contact, even though no one is really there. Which is probably why this video for practicing eye contact has almost 2 million views and is actually kinda tough. And to me, this is one of the most viscerally human responses someone can have to media. But my friends, I think you all know that fourth wall breaks can get even more primal than this. So to wrap this up, let's talk about the creme de la creme of fourth wall breaks in video games, the deepest layer, when the characters know a little too much. So back in 79, author Beeman and his colleagues ran a study on Halloween where they'd observe kids to see if they would follow written instructions to only take one piece of candy from bowls at random houses in the given area. At houses where a mirror was set up right by the bowl such that the kids could see their own reflection, trick-or-treaters were much more likely to follow the instructions and only take one candy. The bowls with instructions but no mirror had far more candy taken on average. And this has been replicated in adults as well, using not just mirrors, but also monitors displaying the subject's image. Studies have found evidence that seeing your own reflection or even yourself on camera can affect your likelihood to follow rules, choose not to litter, and even facilitate healthy dietary decisions. These studies have been so influential, in fact, that you've probably seen businesses put up a monitor to show you walking into the store in plain sight at the entrance, or even one of these mirror monitors at the Target self-checkout to discourage shoplifting. And it makes sense. When we see our reflection, it's like we're reminded of what we look like to the outside world and that everything we do is seen. It's sort of the same sensation as the audience effect, except now that audience includes us and we're hyper aware of our every move. So when Psycho Mantis reads your memory card and sees that you've been playing Castlevania, your reaction is probably something like, how the hell does he know that? Why does he know that? Does he know who I am? I don't like this at all. How, how does he, what? What is this? Now I'll read more deeply into your soul. Wait, can you see my browser history? You see, games have the unique opportunity to break the fourth wall and then make a huge leap to identifying something super specific about you, which makes you acutely aware that you, yes, you, are a part of this and that your actions are not anonymous. When Monica reads your Steam account and calls you by your actual name, it's not just encroaching on your anonymity, it's kicking the door in. It's putting your hamster ball through a wood chipper. We go from a comfortable bystander simply pressing buttons to a participant in the action responsible for everything that's been happening to these characters. And they know that. They've been your guinea pigs this whole time, and you're just now being made startlingly aware of it. So play nice. And this makes for some beautifully twisted moments where all at once, you don't feel like your actions are influencing some random characters in some game, you're affecting a whole other reality that is keenly aware of you and the real world. I won't spoil too much because I haven't actually played this game just yet, but in the original version of One Shot, you must complete the game in one shot, otherwise the world you leave behind when you close the window will change for good. Oh, and the main character calls you by name, which kinda cuts deep if you mess up. Spec Ops The Line doesn't actually identify you in any way, but it does subtly change the loading screen menus after you incinerate the wrong people, asking you haunting questions like, do you feel like a hero yet, or why should you care about killing since this isn't real? 
Undertale hits you with a pretty similar dose of guilt by again addressing you directly and making it starkly clear that your actions matter to this reality. I feel like if Undertale did something like Metal Gear Solid or Doki Doki and specifically identified you, it would be the magnum opus of a fourth wall breaking guilt trip. Like, can you imagine if Flowey called you by name, or if mid-fight Sans read your PC or your console memory and said something like... If a game could somehow get your image on screen when shaming you for being a horrible person, I think it would really have that target checkout line effect of making you hyper aware of yourself and add to the shame of whatever you just did in the game. I never thought we would be looking to target's checkout line for game design inspiration, but... Here we are. Moments like these flip the script from an anonymous person on the couch just playing a game for a good time to a very real specific person influencing what now feels like a very real specific world. And to me, this harkens back to that moment where all at once the masked audience went from jeering laughter to stunned horror that their incognito decisions had shockingly real consequences. The fourth wall isn't just about keeping a story separate from the real world, it's also about protecting us from any form of social burden or liability, especially in games. And when it's broken, we may feel more than just charmed, we may feel more than just spooked, we may very well feel exposed. Oh hey there! What are you still doing here? Video's over. Oh. Oh, you must want a post credit scene. Okay, I got you. Well, joke's on you, my friend. We haven't even got to the credits yet. And I'm creatively drained, so you're not getting one. Oh, oh, oh why am I creatively drained, you ask? Well, to be honest, I kind of blew my load on Animal Crossing. I mean, the video did really well, thank you for that, but I'm kind of out of juice. I'm kind of like that, that empty Capri Sun that you inflate and then put on the sidewalk and stomp so it pops really loud. Um, but, and let's be honest, you know, the, the video you just watched, it, it was mediocre at best. It wasn't my best work, so. So, I'm gonna take a few days. I'm gonna recharge my batteries a little bit. I'm gonna enjoy myself. I'm gonna play a little bit of this, you know? I'm sure some of you guys are doing the same, so. Anyways, um, no post credit scene. In fact, I'll tell you what, instead of a post credit scene, I'll just give you this video I found of a man playing with a bear in a river. How's that sound? Yeah, you like that? Okay, we're gonna go with that. Cue the bear. <laughs> 